I don't know where you are in your journey with Jesus. I don't know where you are in your walk of life. And, and I have seen God do miraculous things, transformational things, and God has blown my mind in what he has allowed Megan and I to be a part of and lead in Eunice, E-U, NiceChurch.com, Eunice, Louisiana. It was a shameless plug just as a supplement. We'd love to be a part of your lives as well. We don't get anything out of it except for getting to meet you in the kingdom and celebrate together what God has done. But I've, I've seen God do a lot of things, and I think many of you have, have too. But I read in the Word of God that the prophet, Hosea said it this way. He said, Lord, in our time of deep need, and how many of you know as a nation, we are in a time of deep need. As the people of God, we are in a time of deep need. I believe that we are in a place around the globe where the people of God have a greater need than any generation have ever had before. And the prophet Isaiah said, God, in our time of deep need, I've heard about your works. I've been in all of the things that you've accomplished. But God, in our time of deep need, what you've done before, before, God do it again. God do it again in this generation. Come on. God do it again in our hearts. God do it again in our homes. Do it again in our lives, oh God. I know that the best things of your kingdom are not behind us. God, what you've done before, do it again. I came to tell you this morning that God's not done. That is the prophetic word for this place this morning. If you thought he was finished, I came to tell you he's just getting started. I've seen him do some great things, but he's not done with me yet. Yay! Come on, somebody say, he's not done with me yet. Yay! There's so much more to the story. My God's not done with me yet. Can we do it one more time? He's not done with me yet. Hey, I know the Father. He's not done with me yet. Oh, there's so much more to his story. God's not done with me yet. Come on, lift your hands all over this place. You pray for me. I'll pray for you. Father, I pray right now. Come on, open them up today. Father, we pray that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. God, I pray for every heart in this place and watching online. God, I pray for every room in which you desire to fill. God, every temple in which you desire to dwell. I pray, God, that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. God, I pray that you would soften every heart in this place, that you would make us delicate before you. God, turn the hearts of stone into sponges that receive today. And God, I pray that you would align our mind with the mind of Christ. I pray that our spirit would be in tune with your spirit and that we would understand and comprehend how this message applies to us when we're tempted to think about somebody else that needs to hear this word. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would put us back in our place, which is at your feet and in your presence. And I pray that you would reveal what you have to say that is going to transform us from the inside out. I pray all these things in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen and amen. Come on, give God praise one more time. We're going to get into this. Pastor Nate, go get something to drink. Woo, he's going to come back and help me. I love that dude. I love Pastor Nate. That brother makes me feel, I just walked in, just getting around him makes me feel more spiritual. Like the soul just dripped off of him and got on me. My brother from another mother. I love that guy. Hey, I, I read in the book of Hebrews that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. This is why we need help. This is why we need God. Because, because people are watching and people are listening and uh, people are evaluating. Whew. People are evaluating. Thank you, Holy Spirit. People are evaluating what they believe about God based on how we behave. Um, 
and and so we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses in the heavens and on the earth and 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 the bible says therefore we should cast off the way come on you can't run like you're supposed to when you're weighed down by things that god wants to get off of you so cast off woo, cast off the weight that so are y'all gonna preach with me better than first service you know i i believe in competition the last time i read my bible jesus won i'm competitive i say we win come on come on second service you're gonna win in the spirit today the bible says cast off the weight that so and the sin that so easily entangles yeah why why though because you have a race to you have a race to run and you're not gonna run it and beg your way through no you're gonna run it with endurance why how in the world am i gonna run a race with endurance because Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says you're going to do something that other people aren't willing to do. You're going to fix your eyes on Jesus. Yeah, You're going to be a focused people. Why? Because there's so much more to the story. How do you know there's more to the story? Because I know the author. I know the one who's holding the pen. I know who's writing my tomorrow. And he knows my tomorrow better than I remember my yesterday. He's the author and the perfecter. Hang on, y'all going to make me over preach. I'm going to hurt myself. Nope, I'm going to get it all done. We're going to do it together. Thank you, Jesus. He's the author and perfecter. And the Bible says, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. How in the world did he have joy before the cross? Because he knew what the cross was going to complete. Come on. If you knew what your wilderness was going to work out. If you know what was going to be produced by what you're going through right now. See, you think you are in a season that you've got to survive. But really, you're in a season that is preparing you to thrive. Yeah, yeah, it's preparation that is preparing you. You may be thinking, I'm in the middle of a valley, but I read a psalm about being in the valley. Yay! Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because I realize where I am, but I know who's with me where I am. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So for the joy set before me, I will endure because I believe in a God who has the ability to produce through what I'm willing to be prepared by. For the joy endured the cross. The Bible says that then he sat down at the right hand of God. And he's seated there to this day. My Bible says that he is intercessing. He has a responsibility. The son isn't just up there waiting on Gabriel to take his the son's horn and let everybody know he's coming. He's doing something right now. The Bible says he's interceding on our behalf. He's praying for us right now. The Apostle Paul, very similar passage, um, he's writing to a church, and the apostle wants the church to know. We're in a series at our church called Focus. Because I've noticed, Pastor, this is my third, um, uh, I guess, term, if you will, to pastor a church through an election year. And I've noticed that there's something distracting, specifically distracting. I'm going to come back to politics in a minute. I have a political science major. That's my undergraduate degree. Um, but So I, I see the value there. But I noticed that people who didn't argue about things for three years previously will all of a sudden become extremely combative about temporary issues and temporary problems and, and earthly policies and even possibly ungodly people. Help me preach just a little bit. Make sure that you're hearing. Oh, hey, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm a hollerback kind of a guy. I don't know if you've noticed. Like, um, you can preach with me. You can preach at me. You can be like, amen. You can be like, come on. You can be like, hey, that's for me. You can stand up and point be like, hey, that was for you. You know, whatever you want to do. Just, I'm Red Bull ready. You know what I'm saying? I would pop a feel to know. So you, but, I, and I get that we're in some trying times. Um, but the apostle, the apostle wanted the church to know that especially during trying times and, 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 and I would even say demonically distracting times, that we have a job. We're called to be focused people 
Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, the apostle says it this way. And I am certain, I'm certain that God, I've seen him do it before. God who began, he began a good work within you. And he will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Now, this message, I don't do this very often. I had something else on my heart to preach, and last Sunday I preached this message at our church, and it was fresh in my spirit, but I don't believe that this is a message that is designated to a church in Eunice, Louisiana. I, I believe that this is a message that is, that is good for the movement that God wants to use. Come on, somebody, specifically in such, and, and I know this is super biblical, but for such a time as this. Here's what the apostle, I want to preach until it is finished. The apostle the apostle wanted us to know that God, the same God we read about from Genesis to Malachi and Matthew to Revelation, that same God, he had the power, he has the power, and he will always have the power to finish what he started. He's not done. God, he, he, he has all power. He has all authority. God has the power to finish, to complete, to perfect what he began. Um, in Acts chapter 16, uh, you don't have to go there. I'll just, you can go read about it later. The apostle Paul, um, he, he wanted to go. The Bible says he's on his second, he's on his second uh, uh, missionary journey, and he really wanted to go preach in Asia. He ultimately wanted to go to Rome, but he wanted to preach in Asia. And the, the Bible says the Holy Spirit did not allow him. This is important. Don't get lost in my tone here. I say a lot of things, but I want you to catch this one. Um, the Holy Spirit did not allow him to go. And so, because the Holy Spirit told him not to, Paul didn't. Okay? And I think that that's important. That may be a fresh word for somebody in this room today. Um, before God can show you what he has for you, you've got to learn how to listen to the voice that says, I don't want you to go there anymore. Come on, you understand what? I don't want you to get in there anymore. I don't want you to do that anymore. I want you to stop. And I know the church has been so uh, blatantly uh, forward on what they're against that at times we forgot to speak on what we're actually for. But until God can show you what he has for you, you've got to learn how to listen to Holy Spirit and stop doing what he died for. Stop doing what he doesn't want you to do so that he can reveal to you what he does want you. There is something God wants you. I feel this right now. Hang on. Let me just hang out here. There is something that God wants you to do. If somebody's in this place and you want God to give you a word, the problem is he's not going to tell you something new until you learn how to listen to what he's already said. When you stop doing what you want to do, then you can start doing what he wants you to do. And Paul, Paul decided to listen to that still small voice. And he, even though he wanted to, he decided not to. And he went to sleep that night, and then God gave him a vision. Come on, there's a vision on the other side of your obedience. Paul went to sleep that night, and he had a vision. And the Bible says of a Macedonian man. So he woke up the next morning and he took Silas and his entourage, his traveling companions. And they went um, down to the area of Macedonia. And they landed in a little, a little village, if you will, called Philippi. When he got to Philippi, he's looking for a Macedonian man. Remember, that was his vision. Say, come to Macedonia. And, and he's looking for a Macedonian man. And he comes upon a group of women. Come on, some of y'all looking for a man. That ain't even, I didn't say this in first service. Some of y'all looking for a man, but what you need to find is a prayer group. There's a group of women that were so focused on the king and praying out the will of God that they weren't worried about what they wanted. They weren't worried about the fact that the men in the city were leaving them out, that they didn't even consider them influential enough to build a temple or be part of a temple. So they said, you know what? We don't need your building. We're going to go down here on the banks of the river because I read in Psalm chapter 1 that I could be like a tree 
planted by the rivers and I could bear fruit in every season. My leaf would never wither as a tree planted by the river. So he found this group of women and one of those women was named Lydia and she was an entrepreneur. She was a business owner. The Bible says that she was a maker of purple dyes. And even though, catch this, men and, and, and women alike, catch this, even though she didn't have influence, because just because of her gender, but she didn't have influence in that community, but she had something that people in that community realized they needed. You don't have to have the influence that you want, but you have to have something that the people around you recognize they need. And when you operate in what God's given you the gift to, to, to complete and to produce, then the people that you don't have influence with will come running to you because they realize there's something inside of you. And they realize that you're producing something that they want to get in them and produce as well. So God used Lydia and this group of women and, and she took the, 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 the apostle and, and his entourage to her house and they were having Bible studies and she was a host for them. And Paul and Silas began to preach the gospel there in Philippi. And the Bible says a little girl, yeah, a demonic little girl, she was like a little soothsayer. She was a fortune teller. She was a slave um, to a man that owned her and was making money off of her to tell fortunes. And that little demonic girl was, was chasing, following the apostle Paul around, and he got tired. He got tired of that little girl. And, and hey, listen, I can't blame him because, like, I have a hard time with kids that don't listen to. Like, I'm just, it just gets, that's why I thank God for Pastor Karima and the children's ministry team, you know. You know, because the Apostle Paul, he got tired of that kid just manifesting. He turned around and he cast the devil out of that baby. You can't just do that in kids' church. You know what I mean? But, you know, if, I, if I'm a children's pastor and there's just this kid just losing their mind, you know, and I just cover them in oil, you know, and I just throw the whole bottle on them. I give that baby back at the end of that service and I'm like, hey, mama, you know what? I'm sorry. I know she came in clean, but now she's washed white as snow. Come on. I know she's covered in oil, but she started manifesting in the middle of the message so we cast the devil out and she's going to be better than she's ever been before that mama ain't never coming back I'm telling you right now but Paul got tired of it and so and he wasn't a children's pastor either so he just cast the devil out. he didn't even ask God he didn't even ask God he just cast the devil out well that made her owner mad why because when you interrupt something that somebody has found uh, and placed their identity in, when, when you begin to challenge, mm -hmm, when, when an owner's finances are affected, when somebody has placed their faith in something that provides something for them, we call that an idol. He had placed his identity there. But when you start messing with how people are making and or spending their money in the name of kingdom investment, people, instead of getting excited, they get offended. I've just found that people get offended by things that they put their faith in. And look, so, so we don't put our faith, come on, we don't put our faith in athletics and extracurriculars and we don't put our faith in our job and, and how we can make money. That's why an LSU fan can preach to, to some Florida Gator fans. Come on, somebody. And, and, and whoever, or the, or the you, come on, somebody. Michael Urban, I love you too. But what, that's why, because we haven't put our faith in things that are fleeting like this man. But he was mad. So he had Paul and Silas arrested. And, and, and they were placed in prison and they were, they were shackled in chains and they were sitting there, the Bible says, at the midnight hour. Mm. I read another scripture about the midnight hour. I'm going to come to it before this service is over with. What I want you to understand is that our praises, our praises to God cannot be contingent upon a place. I, I want you to see that Paul and Silas did not allow the prison to stifle their praise. I'm telling you, when you're under pressure, you feel bound up in chains and people try to lock you up and put you in places that you don't deserve. You got to praise him anyway. Come on, because the praises weren't contingent upon the prison, but I'm telling you that the prison is contingent upon the praise. The Bible said when they began to sing the hymns and they began to praise him anyway and they were worshiping God because worship
worship is a weapon, those shackles began to become brittle and they came off of the hands of the apostle and his entourage and everybody in those prison cells. The Bible says that those prison doors swung open and if Chris would have been in that prison, when Chris sees an open door, he runs through. But not Paul and Silas. They stayed there and they prayed and the Philippian jailer pulled out his sword thinking that everybody was going to escape and he was going to take his own life because it would have been taken from him anyway because he was responsible for those prisoners and the apostle Paul interrupted the 15th chorus of his praise and he yelled out to that Philippian jailer stop and he made him wait in the Philippian jail he said we're all here we're still here in fact he looked into the eyes of that Macedonian man that he had a vision of just a few days before and he shared what that man needed that he didn't even know. And that man asked an age-old question, what must a man do to be saved? And the apostle Paul said, I got a simple answer. You ain't got to overcomplicate it. Come on. You ain't got to go through classes. You just got to call upon the name. He said, only believe in the name of the Lord Jesus and you and everybody you love are going to be saved because there is no other name by which a man should be saved and here's what I love about that story what I love about that story is God saw a group of uninfluential women a demonic little girl and a Gentile suicidal jailer and he said yeah let's start a church and right there in Philippi, he started a church with a bunch of crazy people. That's what I came to tell you down here in Florida. I came to tell you that God uses crazy people to build crazy kingdoms. God uses the unworthy and the unable, and he puts his name on them, and he anoints them with his sovereignty, and the anointing of God begins to flow through the crazy. Come on, come back. And God uses those people even though they're not able just because they're available. God started a church and the apostle couldn't stay, but they began, they continued meeting anyway. And then we forward to this letter he wanted these people to remember. Hey, the day that you gave your life to Jesus, God began a good work. He wanted those women to remember. I know you don't have the influence that you're gonna have. And even to this day, Men try to stifle women and keep their leadership to the back rooms. But I say preach from the pulpit, sweetheart. Lead that place. Let God use you because the gifts of God are not subject to the gender he created. This, this, these, this letter was written to a group of women and a demonic little girl that would probably hear about a man named Timothy that Paul said, hey, I don't want you to despise your youth. Don't let people talk down to you because you're not old enough or have enough tenure. God wants to use you. What he began in you, I know that owner is trying to oppress you, but you're a slave in this world, but you're a daughter in God's kingdom, and God's going to use you. I want you to remember, Philippian jailer, I know that you're still a Gentile, and there are Jewish people trying to suffocate what God's done in you, and there are Roman overseers that are trying to oppress what God wants to do in you, but God hasn't forgotten about you. He remembers the night that we were singing his prayer praises and you confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth and God began a good work on the day you were born again. Now I want to address this really quickly. I want you to know this is your note. Jesus, it is Jesus, Christ and Christ alone that makes us right with God. It is Christ and Christ alone that makes us right with God. There's some, there's some weird doctrine out there. There's some bad teaching out there. Doctrine, doctrine. by the way, uh, let me teach for a minute. Let me come down off of this spiritual heel I'm on. Um, doctrine is just how you interpret the word of God. Okay. Uh, why are there so many churches? Because people misinterpret the word of God. 
right? And, and I'll be honest, hear me. I grew up in one interpretation. I, I pastor around a ton of interpretations, and I studied. God helped me, Holy Spirit, to show myself approved, and I landed with an ordination in the assemblies of God. I take my wife to assemblies of God. That's what this church is. That's what our church is. This is a movement of 70 million spirit-filled adherents worldwide, and the reason that we are a part of this movement is because we believe that the proper interpretation of the Word of God is being shared from those who oversee and protect the doctrine. Are y'all okay? There's some crazy doctrines out there. There are some, and I'm, I'm not, listen, don't let me, don't let me hurt your feelings right here. Just hang in here with me because I grew up being told by some people that, that once you are saved, you, there, it doesn't matter what you do after that. This is dangerous. I'm telling you, what you what, once you are saved, you can't walk away. You can't depart the faith, even though Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 4 that in the last days many will depart the faith. You, you can't even fall away, even though the author of Hebrews said, if you fall away. Uh, in Demas, he departed the faith. And there's a doctrine that teaches it doesn't matter what you do. This is unconditional security. You know, once you're saved, you're, you're saved. There's nothing you can... Okay, hang on, though. On, the, on this side is, is these... Man, I mean, you, you lose your salvation for stumping your toe and thinking a cuss word. You know what I'm saying? That, I don't believe that either because I hit my knee at the hotel the other night on a desk, and I'm telling you, I wasn't thinking glory to God on the highest. That's not, that wasn't the first thought that I had. Now, there were three kids in the room, so I prayed in tongues instead of Chris. You know what I'm saying? They were like, Daddy, are you okay? I was like, I don't know, but I, I got to be careful because out of the abundance of the heart. You know what I'm saying? But there are people... That that they're afraid. Uh, they think if you buy gold earrings and, and if, if you wear pants and, and, and if you go watch a movie cause, or if you turn on too much TV because the TV's a one-eyed devil with a tail and, and if you wear them, them sleeveless shirts, you know, you little har harlot pagan. No, and, then, and then over here is people that don't even believe you can have eternal security. I, I pastor some of those people. I've had, I've had a widow come to me with, a, with, with an envelope full of cash and say, Pastor, what do you want? Me, what should I do with this? And I was like, oh, what did God tell you to do with it? I don't know. What do, what do you say? She said, people gave this to me when my husband passed away because I'm supposed to pay a church leader to perform services so that my husband's soul can move up through levels of purgatory until he finally gets into heaven. I said, ma'am, listen to me. I need to tell you something right now. If the blood of Jesus ain't enough to get you from here to there. Come on. If the sacrifice of Jesus Christ himself, my Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It is appointed unto man once to die, and then I'm standing with God, and he's going to look at me and see if I'm covered in the blood or covered in my sin. You can do whatever you want to do with that money. They gave it to you. You do what God tells you to do. I had a mama looking at me. I performed a service for a baby a baby that had passed away and that mama was worried about where her baby was going to spend eternity because it wasn't baptized in the church i'm telling listen to me hear me bad doctrine will mess you up and I just want to let you know this is a safe place. Come on, I've met these people. This is a place where doctrine is preached and protected. Unadulterated, the word of God is, is coming out of this pulpit from the heart of these people. Jesus makes us right with God. My Bible says it's not by works. No, oh, come on, somebody. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. Salvation is not something that you can earn. Salvation is only something that you can receive. It's not by works, lest any man should boast. It is a gift of God. Oh, I feel like preaching right here. For you are God's masterpiece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before the very foundations of the earth, he knit you together in your mother's womb. He knew you before he created the world. And he says that you are, yeah, even you, the one that's insecure and doesn't like hearing stuff like this, the one that thinks, well, God can use somebody, but he can't use me. I came to tell you this morning, if he can use anything, he can can use you. If he can use me, he can use you. You are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works. Martin Luther Martin Luther grew up in this ideology that taught that you had to perform your way into the kingdom of God. 
and he was reading in the book of Romans the letter that Paul wrote to the people in Rome, not a bishop, that's a side note, but a people, a group of people who were serving God in Rome. And in the first chapter, Martin Luther got down to around verse 16, and he saw that the apostle said, made a statement that got into his soul. It said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel, that's the good news, is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. He flips that book over and he reads in Romans chapter 3 verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then in Romans 5 1, he read that we are justified. Come on. We are justified by faith in Jesus. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because Romans 6 23, yeah, I just want somebody to remember what God has done in your life thus far. Romans 6 23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. It's a gift. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it, but he purchased it for you anyway. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Listen to me. The day the moment, some of you think you prayed a prayer that God didn't hear. No, no, no. He's a good father. <laughs> He's a father of, of heavenly lights. He doesn't cast shifting shadow. He changeth not. Can I tell? Let me see if I can do it in 30 seconds. I came out of my house. Uh, we only had one baby. Megan had three babies in four years. Can, uh, this is a second service only. Three babies in four years. Yeah, she, don't, she just can't keep her hands on. They're never done. So yeah, then. It was when we only had one, and she was still young. Maybe, em no, Emery was born. We had two, just not the boy. And, and I heard, I went and got in my truck, and I heard a little voice coming out of the door. That little voice is 14 now. It doesn't sound like this anymore, but she came. I heard this little voice. I was getting in my truck, and I heard, Daddy! My garage was already closing. I jumped out of my truck. It wasn't in reverse yet. Thank God. It had been in the neighbor's living room. I jumped out of my truck, and I ran, and that garage, <laughs> that garage was coming down, and I didn't have a garage door opener, you know, so I had closed it, and I did the thing, you know what I'm talking about? Just, so and that's how I got to my truck, and it was on its way down, and I heard, Dad! And I got out of my truck and I ran over there and that garage door was still coming down. So I tried to get under it and it got stuck. And, it was, and then she's going, Dad, Daddy. You know, but I'm telling you, when I heard my baby call my name, I would have ran through that garage door and replaced it later. I came to tell you, when you called upon the name of Jesus, when you said, Daddy, he heard your prayer, my Bible says, I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's what he does. When you confessed his name, you were born again. And I want you to be encouraged that the day you were born again, you became a new creation. When you came to Christ, you were a new creation. Old things pass away. All things become new. God made you and God calls you righteous. The blood of Jesus was applied to your sin and your shame, and he exchanged your filthy rags for a white robe of righteousness. If you are in Christ, hear this. If you are in Christ, you are as righteous right now as you will ever be. You can't be more righteous than righteous. You understand? Well, yeah, yeah, but what about growing more and more like Jesus? Yeah, we call that sanctification, and that starts at salvation and continues as we remain in Christ. But I heard the bishop say it this way, and I just want to make sure that you didn't miss it in everything else I've said. You can't be more saved than saved. He began a good work when you were born again. This is the story of God desiring relationship with fallen man. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came and did what we could not do. Now, he's not going to do what you can do. I'm coming to that. 
But he came and did what you could not do because he wanted you despite what you didn't do. That's good preaching right there. And this is what happens when we trust his plan of salvation. Though my sins were like scarlet, his blood has been applied and washed me white as snow. Since I couldn't go to God, God put on flesh and he came to me. And God showed his own love for us in this while we were still sinning. While we were still running and rebelling and being disobedient, Jesus Christ died for us. Here's what happened. The Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of men could become the sons of God. And I came to remind you that when you confess him as Lord, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. That's good doctrine. It's not... And I didn't make it up. I studied it out. I just found it. Now, within that work of salvation that God did for us, we then begin to discover what God has called us to do for him. Mm, where'd all the shouts go? <laughs> the shouts went silent. Wait, wait, wait. What? Talk about what God did for me again. I like that one. No, no, no. Now that he saved you, we already know what he saved us from. Now he wants to show us what he saved us for. Now, I, I, don't, know, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a church. But Pastor Bill, we were always, we were rapture ready. You know what I mean? Like, and that's good doctrine, by the way. It's sound doctrine to believe and know that that's imminence, that Jesus can come back at any time. That's good doctrine. You need to be watchful, prayerful, prayerful alert, and ready. Why? Because he's coming back for a bride. Oh, my Lord, I'm preaching every scripture. He's coming. He ain't coming back for a sleepy bride. He ain't coming back for a lazy bride. He ain't coming back for a bride that's shacked up in the back of a truck with the world. Who help me preach. He's coming back for a bride who's prepared and ready and has a lamp full of oil and they're busy about the master's business. But we were, we were, we, we were ready. Come on, Jesus could come back at any time. Rapture ready. But at some point, come on, did anybody raise, was anybody raised in a, in a thief in the night kind of a church? You watched that, you saw the thief in the night. Yeah, y'all, we were ready. We prayed that crazy prayer. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. You know what I'm saying? We teach our kids that prayer. If I should die before I went, well, I'm about to die. No, 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 baby. We're just praying. Why are we praying that? <laughs> we were rapture ready. We would, we would watch movies and read books called Left Behind. You know? We'd trick people. We'd be like, hey, you want to go watch a movie at my house? Get the popcorn ready. I know a guy in our town. He's the husband of one of the pastors there in town. She preaches. She's fire. She's a great leader. And uh, she he brought her boyfriend over at the time. And he wasn't living for Jesus, and I don't think she was either. But her mama was, and her mama was praying. And mama, listen to me. Grandmother, listen to me. Your prayers are harder to reject than they are to receive. So even if you're not seeing the fruit of that prayer, you just keep praying. Because I'm telling you, they're coming. They're coming. So that boy went over to that mama's house. They were, he was going to watch a movie with her daughter. That mama put in a VHS. Y'all remember them things? His mama put in a VHS. My brother was high as a kite. He'd been smoking every piece of grass he could find for the whole day. I'm talking been eating brownies and chewing on lettuce. And he went in that living room, and that mama put Left Behind on. Now, I know you've seen Left Behind, but you ain't never seen Left Behind high as a kite. But my man and saw he thought he was psychedelically freaking out and what he realized was wait this movie's based on something and that movie got in his spirit and he got his life right with God and he is the husband supportive husband of a preaching woman to this day and that's awesome but here's the problem if we're not careful we will become so rapture ready that we are not kingdom committed I don't know when this happened I just know that it's something that I thought. At some point, the church began to call salvation finished. But Paul said salvation is when this process began. 
Salvation is when God just gets started in your life. At some point, we became so ready to go to heaven that we forgot that Jesus told his disciples that while I'm gone, I have anointed you to occupy the earth. You pray the same way that I pray. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm not trying to get to heaven. I'm anointed by Holy Ghost power power to bring heaven to the earth. I'm kingdom first, foremost, every time and all the time. And God called you to be kingdom, whether you're a teacher or a preacher. Come on, whether you're opening the door on Sunday morning or you're leading a group on Monday night, whether you're coaching at a high school or working in a hospital, maybe you're a roughneck on a pipeline or on a well somewhere. I'm telling you, wherever God puts you, he wants you to be kingdom. Maybe you're a politician. I want you to know that God doesn't lean left. Y'all not going to like this. And God doesn't lean right, but he leans into the word that he has already spoken. Kingdom doesn't have a side. Kingdom is a side. So we register to vote and we represent the ecclesia because God didn't say, I'm going to build a white house. He didn't say, I'm going to build a nation. But Jesus Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We are the ecclesia. We are the governing body of God Almighty on the earth. So let heaven come. That's what God's called us to do. So Jesus made us right with God. But Jesus made us righteous for a reason. I'm saved. I'm abiding in Christ. And now what? Well, now, says the apostle, I believe the best day of your life is the day that you surrendered it to Jesus. And if you haven't done that yet, you're about to. I speak it into the room. I claim you in Jesus' name. The best day of your life is when you confess Jesus as Lord. The best day of my baby's life was the day that they confessed Jesus as Lord. And then I got to baptize her. What a beautiful day. What a beautiful day. The second best day of your life. And I love preaching this somewhere else because this isn't going to benefit me, but it's going to benefit this city. The second best day of your life is when you begin to discover why God saved you and where he wants you to plug into the body. Come on, I don't know. I don't know if you're a hand or a mind, but I'm telling you, the body has many members and they're all important. And the body, when it's connected, there's blood rolling through it. And it's healthy. And healthy things grow. Watch this. But if you disconnect from the body. <laughs> the second service only. If the thumb is disconnected from the body. It dies. God didn't create you to be portable. He created you to be planted. He created you to be connected. Because not only does the thumb die, but now the body that could have been fivefold is missing part of its membership. And instead of being divinely destined, it's disabled. And I've been around a lot of disabled bodies. I don't know about you. I don't pastor one. We'll run off and leave you. <laughs> but I've been around a lot of disabled bodies. And by the way, I'll leave the 99 to go after the one, too. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. Paul said it this way in verse 9. I pray that your love 
I, I don't want you just to know that God began something. I want you to know that he's faithful to finish what he started. Until it's finished, he will continue to work. And so verse 9 says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more. And, and, and that you will keep on growing. God didn't want you to just get saved. Are y'all okay? He don't want you to just get saved. He wants you to grow. I, I don't even like that. I don't even like that phrase. I'm, I'm not saying it's like unbiblical. I just don't like it. I'm, because I, I got saved when I was seven. I got saved again when I was nine. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I got saved again when I was 16. In fact, you know what? I got saved at every revival. I showed, I, I went to heaven's gates, hell's flames. I got saved again. Just make sure. I, I, I showed 23 minutes in hell by Bill Weiss to a room full of teenagers. <laughs> Mamas were mad. I don't care. It's in the Bible. 23 minutes in hell. I had people get saved three times in, three, in 23 minutes. You know what I'm saying? Like the whole student ministry. Here's the problem. Fear is not a good motivator. It's not. And God doesn't just want you to get saved. God doesn't want to come into your life. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. No, 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 no. He doesn't want to come into your life. He wants you to give your life to him. He wants to take your life and make it his. He wants to flip your life upside down and make it look more like Jesus than it did who you came from. That's what he wants to do. So, but here's the problem. People don't get focused. And so when they receive salvation, instead of following Jesus, come on, some of y'all are written it. You're in here right now. Instead of following Jesus and focusing on Jesus, and remaining in Christ, you focused on the same things you used to focus on. And you, like me, at one point in my life, you were like the person that the author of Hebrews was referring to. You fell away. Why did you fall? Because you weren't focused on Jesus. You focused on what he got you out of. And the Bible says, Jesus said, like a dog, you return to the vomit. I didn't say it. It's in the Bible. Like Demas, you departed the faith. And Jesus said this. Look, check this out. Jesus said that I can come in and I can cast out the devils. And then the man that I cast the devil out of can sweep his whole house and put everything in order and look really good on Sunday. But if that house is empty, when that devil gets back from the recruiting trip that he went on, because that devil, when it was cast out, went and found seven more devils that were worse than himself. And he came back, and because the house was swept clean and put in order, but it was empty, he went into that house with all of those devils. And the Bible says the final condition of that man, you ever met somebody receive salvation, get all excited, but then they don't focus, and they end up worse than they were before they ever met Jesus in the first place? Yeah, that's what Jesus was talking about. The final condition of that person was even greater than the worst. Here's the good news today. I know a woman named Mary from Magdala who had seven devils inside of her. I don't know how many times she was delivered. I just know that when she met Jesus, he cast those devils out and she was sitting at the tomb waiting for him to do what he said he was going to do. And she became the world's first evangelist. Yeah. So if you're in this place today and you ain't got seven devils, you're doing better than Mary of Magdala. And if he can deliver her, he can can deliver you too. The greatest tragedy in Christianity is not that people don't receive salvation. That's that's the greatest tragedy I think is the people that do never discover why. And then instead of accomplishing the will of God, they fall back into the things that God saved them from. That is the greatest tragedy in my opinion. Here's the final point. Focus helps us fulfill the Father's plan. You just got to fix your eyes on Jesus. I was wondering if he was ever going to get to the point. Yeah, yeah, we're going to focus. Mm -hmm. 
Paul said in verse 10 of Philippians chapter 1, I want you to understand. Here's what I want you to understand. I want you to understand what really matters. Even in an election year, I want you to understand what really matters. Your vote, your, vote, your voice it matters. Get registered. Go vote. People died so you could go to the voting poll. Jesus gave his life so that you could hear his voice and represent the kingdom when you cast the vote. Okay? Okay? But, but, but focus and understand what really matters. Why? So that you can live a pure and blameless life until the day of Christ's return. Look, until the rapture. You're ready. Verse 11. How do you know you're ready? May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. There's some crazy doctrine out there. Come on, people, people are, are, are believing what they hear from these TikTok theologians instead of their pastor that's actually planted somewhere and shepherding the sheep. Come on, somebody. Anybody can make, oh, I better be careful right here. They're listening to these yahoos on YouTube. Yeah, I went ahead and said it. And all these Facebook princes instead of the people that God has placed in their lives that's actually investing in them. And they're allowing demonic voices and false teachers. I said it. But same people that the disciples were we're asking about, Lord, how will we know? Jesus called them false teachers and, and ravenous wolves. Here's how you can know. They're trying to make a profit off of you instead of prophesying for the profit of your life and the kingdom of God. They're, they're prophets for profit. That's how you can tell the difference in the preacher and the prophet that is for profit. The one that will share the word of God and doesn't need anything in return except for eternal reward. That's how you can tell the difference. Jesus told his disciples the way that you can tell the difference between a, a ravenous wolf and a real teacher of the word is you can observe the fruit. You will know them by their fruit. That's how you know. By the fruit that's produced. The fruit of salvation. The righteous character produced in your life by Christ Jesus. This will bring much glory and praise. Alright, here's this is my fourth closing. But this is the last one. Give me, give, me, give me two football minutes. You know what I'm saying? It's a two-minute warning. Here's what I want you to understand, because this is going to happen to you. I've seen this over and over again. The enemy, the moment you're born again. See, the devil left you alone when you were doing what he wanted. But the moment that you give your life to Jesus and then the moment that you begin to pursue the presence of God and discover why God saved you, the enemy is going to attack you because he knows that if he can attack you in your infancy, then he can keep you where you are. Mm -hmm. The enemy has been attacking people in the early stages since the book of Genesis. Yeah, when Adam and the woman were created, the enemy was there in the garden, and he didn't wait very long. Why? Because he knows if this man and this woman grow up in this paradise, continuing to walk with God in the cool of the afternoon, they're going to multiply, and I'm not going to be able to handle them. So he came in early in the infancy of that woman and man. And that idiot stood there and just let him do it, you know, as she ate that fruit. And people think, well, the devil tempted her and tricked her into eating the fruit. But that wasn't what he fooled her with. What he did was he came in and he asked that woman, did God really say? Did God really mean? See, the fruit of disobedience was a byproduct of questioning what God actually said. Okay. Now, fast forward to the book of Exodus. The enemy's doing the same thing. Pharaoh hears that there's a deliverer being raised up out of Israel. And he's going to take that deliverer and deliver all the Israelites out of Egypt. So what does Pharaoh do? Pharaoh, possessed by Lucifer himself, in my opinion, decides I'm going to kill every baby under the age of two. So God says, put the baby in the basket because I have a plan. Fast forward to the book of Matthew. King Herod, possessed by a devil. Here's that the king of the Jews has been born in the area. So he tells the Magi, I need you to let me know where that baby's born because I want to go there and worship him too. No, 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 devil. You got kicked out of heaven because you weren't willing to worship God. Now you're trying to tempt us with what you got kicked out for. 
King Herod says, I want to worship him too. And the Magi had enough discernment. You need discernment in this generation because these devils are crafty. They have learned. You know what I mean? You need a spirit of discernment in this generation. And that Magi went around him. And then the angel of the Lord told Joseph, hey, listen, I need to come up with a plan because King Herod is about to kill every baby under the age of two because the enemy knows if I don't kill this baby now, it's going to grow and I'm not going to be able to handle what it grows into. So God took that baby and told Joseph, he said, hey, I've done this before. I'm not afraid of this devil. I had a plan in Genesis. I'm going to do it again. Just take the baby back to Egypt. I already had the demonic Pharaoh raise a deliverer one time. So take that baby back to Egypt. And then that baby came back out of Egypt. And the Bible says that he grew in wisdom and in stat. He grew in wisdom and in stature. This is my last one. In Revelation chapter 12, this is at the last days. Come on, the church, I think, has already been called up because the first four chapters of Revelation is all about the church, but by the time you get to chapter 5, 6, through 10 to 19, you don't see the church anymore. But what you do see is somebody who has conceived something. It's a woman who is pregnant, and she's about to give birth to a baby. And the Bible says that there's a great dragon, and it says it's that devil of old. Hang on a minute. I thought the dragon was a serpent on his belly. He was in the book of Genesis, but so many people between Genesis and Revelation have given the dominion of God over to the enemy of their lives that that dragon has gone from a serpent on the ground to a dragon in the air. That sucker grew because people have been feeding him. And that dragon is trying to take out that woman who put God, who has God inside of her, stirring inside of her. God has birthed something in you. That's why you have that burden. That's why you hadn't left yet. That's why you're still getting plugged in. That's why you're trying to figure this thing out because there's something inside of you now that didn't used to be inside of you and I'm telling you it may not be great and it may be painful but the incubation the incubation that is taking place on the inside of you is going to be worth the labor pains that you're going through. Why? Because what is produced through the preparation was worth it all along the way. The Bible says that baby was born and God snatched that baby up into the heavens. Listen to this. Focus on the father. Why? Because the father in the book of Genesis when the serpent tempted them with an acknowledgement of a doubting the word of God. God said, you know what? I've got a plan. From the sea of woman from the seed of a woman a baby is going to be born and devil you're going to strike at his heel but he's going to crush your head you know what Pharaoh you can kill every baby under the age of two I'm going to put a baby in a basket send it down the Nile and the devil's going to raise my deliverer for me you know what King Herod you can try to come after that baby but that baby is going to grow in wisdom and stature he's going to open up blind eyes he's going to unlock deaf ears he's going to raise the dead he's going to set the captive free and people are going to receive salvation. He's going to turn the sons of men into the sons of God. He's the first son of many sons. And in Revelation chapter 12, God took that baby and brought that. I'm almost done. Hang in here. He took that baby and brought that baby up into the heavens. And in Revelation chapter 19, that baby came through the clouds. He was grown up in glory. He had a name written on his thigh and on his robe. And the name was King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He was faithful and true. He came riding on a white horse with eyes like fire and feet like bronze. A robe drenched in blood with a golden sash. He was and he is and he shall forever be. His name was Jesus. And if he can do it before, he can can do it again. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the everlasting to everlasting. He's faithful and true. What he's done in the past, he's going to do again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for those who love him. His name is Jesus. Jesus, come on, sing it if you know it. Jesus, Jesus, there's just something about that name. Oh, Master, Savior, come on, say it. Jesus. 
Jesus like the fragrance after the rain.